There's an alphabet soup of professions in healthcare. RN, LPN, MD, DO, PA, NP, and then there are hospitalists. Who's who in healthcare? Tonight, on call with the Prairie Duck, celebrating our 20th season. Hi, I'm Dr. Jill Cruz, a hospitalist with Brookings Health System. Tonight, we continue the celebration of 20 seasons of truthful, tested, and timely medical information as we discuss who's who in healthcare. Joining us tonight here in the studio at South Dakota State University campus in Brookings is Dr. Jennifer McKay with Avera Health, and via Zoom, we're joined by internal medicine specialist, Dr. Natalie Owen Sloan. Thank you so much, ladies. So glad to have you both here. We're glad to be, to be here. here. Yes. So, well, um, Jennifer, why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself, where you're from, uh, where you grew up, and uh, what brought you to South Dakota in um, working at McKinnon? Um, well, I'm a South Dakota kid. Um, I grew up West River, Belfouche, South Dakota. Um, went to college and medical school here at USD, and then I left the state with my um, spouse who's also a physician. We went to Washington University in St. Louis and then came back home. So I've been practicing ever since then. Um, about 17 years ago, um, when my baby was just four months old, I started a hospitalist program at Avera McKinnon. Um, that program is now, um, I think, more than 50 physicians, wow. um, which is pretty miraculous considering what we've been through the last uh, 18 months or so. Um, and then I've just kind of been living out my life, taking care of patients in South Dakota. And then I actually have another part of my job, which is in healthcare IT, but that's probably a different story. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see if we have time to, sure. to cover both of them sure. tonight. So, Natalie, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, your background? Sure. I'm not a South Dakota native. I am from South Carolina, um, born and raised there, um, did medical school in the Caribbean and then did my residency down at the Medical College of Georgia in Augusta. Um, I've pretty much been a locums doctor since then, kind of traveling around. I was there in Brookings as a hospitalist for four and a half years. Um, and now I'm doing some work out in Pierre and then over in Gillette, Wyoming. Um, I also have two children um, and just stay busy with work and my family. Excellent. Can you kind of explain to the viewers what is a locums or a locum tenums? Um, it is a, a physician who is not necessarily an employee of the health system that they work for, but they're like an independent contractor. And so you work there for so many shifts um, and you're a physician and you work there as and I do hospitalist work only, um, but you travel. So I could be there anywhere from a week. I've done an assignment for a week in Hawaii or um, you could be like I am currently in Gillette. I've been working here on and off since 2013. So every assignment's just a little bit different depending on what the hospital system's needs are. Uh, I, I think a week in Hawaii sounds lovely. How did you find that job? <laughs> <laughs> um, there's still there's lots of good Hawaii jobs, so I can hook you up. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> Maybe uh, in the middle of winter, it uh, would be a good time to go down there, so. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yes, excellent. Well, we're talking about kind of who's who in the hospital. I mean, when someone's in the hospital, they're going to have people coming in and out of their rooms, and everyone wears scrubs, everyone has masks on. It's hard to tell who's who. So um, is there a good way, Kim, that people can understand who this person that walked in their room is? Um, well, I think a lot of us, we just have to um, tell them. I mean, I, when I go in a room, I have to introduce myself every time, mostly because you know, who the patient was admitted by is maybe not the same person they're seeing today. And then our patients are often older, sometimes hearing impaired, and sometimes they think we say hospice and not hospitalist. So I always just tell them I'm a hospital doctor and I'm there to stand in the shoes of their primary care doctor while they're in the hospital. Yes, yeah. And um, I know I, I always have my ID badge on, and you know, it says physician at the bottom, I've got my white coat on, but a lot of people are wearing white coats now, nurse practitioners, pharmacists. So sometimes the white coat doesn't necessarily mean that that's the doctor that walked in the room. Um, and unfortunately, I think as a, a female, I've had it a couple of times where the patient said, the doctor was never in the room the entire week that I was here. And I was like, yes, I was. I swear, I came there every day. Uh, do either of you, have you had that experience where patients didn't understand who you were, what your degree or role was? They, they, 
yeah, everybody does, but <laughs> I've, I always attribute it to being very youthful in appearance. So I try to take it as a compliment and turn it around because it does happen. And when people are sick, it's just hard. It it's also really hard to read name tags. So I, I know yes. that I find myself kind of peering, and it, they're not as obvious as we'd like to think they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So have you had that uh, experience too? I, I have, unfortunately, and I think just like Dr. McKay says, every time you come in the room, you introduce yourself. I'm the hospital doctor. I agree with her totally <laughs> about saying hospitalist. I think it can be confusing, and like you said, I've had a couple patients also think you are on hospice um, or, or dealing with hospice, so I think saying the hospital doctor um, makes it a lot more clear, and I think you just constantly reiterate you're the physician, um, and you just have to always be clear, always wear your name tag. And then if they ask questions, then of course you just clarify. But I think she's exactly right. We have a lot of elderly patients. They don't hear very well um, and they're sick. So I think you have to take all that into account. Exactly. And those name tags always flip backwards for some reason. <laughs> I mean, even to me, I'm trying to like read, you know, who's the nurse that day or the tech. I'm like, I, your name tames backwards. That doesn't help me. So we maybe should, they, we should put a stamp on our forehead. There that we would go. Work really well. <laughs> I think yeah. that would work. So, yeah, that would be. It, it's it's something to think about. But you know, I know a lot of hospitals have these communication boards where they'll put, you know, this is the patient's name, this is your doctor's name, this is your nurse's name. This is the text name. Sometimes it even has this is your housekeeper's name. So I think having all of those names and sometimes pictures hung up to kind of help people know who is this that's walking in the room and yeah, introducing yourself to, you know, and sometimes the patients know me, but then there's different family members or visitors coming in and introducing you know, you walk out and like, who is that? Oh, yeah, that was the doctor. I think too that healthcare is just so much more complicated than it ever used to be. Um, I think that we just have to sort of appreciate that the complexity is sort of makes it such that when a person comes in the room, you don't know necessarily who it is. Um, I remember a statistic one time that said um, an average patient in the ICU sees over 80 different people, which is a lot. And that's with a, a, an ICU stay of maybe like four days. Mm -hmm. um, of course, with COVID and everything that's going on, the ICU stays are much, much longer. So you can imagine the number of people that are touching that patient. It's pretty incredible. Definitely. So, well, we look forward to answering your questions about hospitalists and the extended healthcare team. Call 1-888-376-6225. Send an email to ask at prairiedoc.org or ask on our Prairie Doc Facebook page. Each night, we work to answer as many of your questions as possible, given the time we have for this episode. We do sometimes receive more questions than we can cover in the time limit. We apologize if we do not get to your question, but we encourage you to ask early to give us the best chance to answer. And to encourage your questions earlier, those of you who ask a question during the first 20 minutes of tonight's program will be entered into a drawing for one of our Prairie Doc gift items. The winner will be announced at the end of this program. Your question will remain anonymous, but be sure to provide your name and contact information when you submit your questions so we can contact the winner. So when those questions come in, we'll start talking about it. So hospitalist is kind of a new concept. How long has that been going on? I think 1995 was the term the we first heard um, the word hospitalist. Um, there are two fathers of hospital medicine, Bob Wachter and another guy by the name of Mark Williams. And both of them have had an amazing effect on the world of hospital medicine. They are still leaders today. Um, in fact, a lot of them still weigh in on a lot of these big, big issues that have come up. So um, it really was an answer to the complexity of healthcare. Um, in bigger cities and bigger facilities with more complex patients, it became more and more challenging to um, see the patient in the morning and then walk away back to your clinic. So hospital medicine was really the answer to complexity and to the growing um, chronic diseases that we were seeing in the country. Um, I've had a really great career with it because um, I've been able to see a lot of the transformative um, sort of high tech things that have happened in healthcare. Um, but at the end of the day, most of us who do internal medicine and become hospitalists, we really, really enjoy the challenge of taking care of sick patients. Mm -hmm. And there definitely is a, a wide range of things that you do with internal medicine. Most hospitalists are internal medicine. I think I'm kind of the outlier as family practice. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, most of us do internal medicine. There are many family practice providers as well. It's really a comfort level because we do take care of super sick people. Um, but internal medicine is really foundational to all of the subspecialists. So if you have a cardiologist, you are first an internist. If you were a rheumatologist, you are first an internist. And it's, um, I always like to think of myself as a, a detective. I'm like the, the Sherlock Holmes of healthcare. Um, and so um, we're the ones that are kind of trying to figure out the really complicated problems. Um, but hospitalists in general are really the captains of the hospital ship. Um, we're the ones that coordinate all the specialists. We're the ones that sort of communicate with the families. Coordinating the discharge is actually probably the biggest part of what we do. Um, and it's really, it's a challenge. It's really fun. And I, I mean, I know there are the hospital's hard, it, it has an ebb and flow to it, but I, I really love it. I love everything about it. Just the kind of the craziness and the noise and the mm -hmm. complexity. So it's a good place to be. Yeah. And you're really taking care of people who need you. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's never a boring day. It's never a boring day. You're always challenged, you're always thinking, it's always, it's using all of those skills you learned in mm -hmm. medical school and residency and really mm -hmm. putting it all together to find that mm -hmm. big picture. I agree, I love the detective part of mm -hmm of the job. Well, and I think, um, you know, we've all worked together. I, we might work at different hospitals, but there have been times when you two have had to transfer patients mm -hmm. to me. Um, so you get to have a lot of relationships with your colleagues. Um, and it's really nice because you feel like, I, I always feel like I'm helping out. Like, you're like, oh, thank God. <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna get to the next level of care. So there's a real collegiality to it um, that I think is incredibly mm -hmm. enjoyable and, and very rewarding. Yes, so Natalie, um, you go at many different hospitals throughout the country. Do you see kind of this program, do hospitals look the same everywhere? Is it kind of a one size fits all or is there kind of unique uh, flavors to it at different places? You know, I think every place is a little bit different, but like Dr. McKay said, I think all of us kind of have a certain, that we have a certain role at every hospital that's basically the same. Um, like she said, admitting patients, talking with families, um, coordinating consultants, you know, figuring out if they need things that we can't do at that facility. And that's when, you know, you call Avera McKinnon or UC Health or, you know, wherever you're wanting to transfer. So I think our, our role is basically the same at every hospital. Um, but, you know, different hospitals do things a little differently. Um, some people have even mid-levels like nurse practitioners and um, PAs that are seeing patients and helping kind of move things through the system. So I think every every hospital just finds the way that works best for them to, you know, get patients taken care of in the best way that they can. Yes, and, and definitely the size of the hospital affects, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you have 50 hospitalists, Brookings has two. <laughs> so very big difference in, in how we run our, our program versus how you run yes. yours. Yeah, I think um, our service is really interesting and I'm a little farther away from it because I've actually done more telemedicine in the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say we probably get um, upward, uh, I'd say an, an one admission an hour at minimum, sometimes mm -hmm. most of the time two um, throughout the day. So lots and lots and lots of patients coming in, very, very sick too. Mm -hmm. um, and it takes a lot of people to make that happen. Yep. Well, we're getting some really good questions in here. It says, when you're in the hospital and seen by the hospitalist, are they in contact with your primary care doctor? For the most part, yes. I, I think, you know, of course, a lot of times we're getting, um, you know, we're getting information from that doctor to begin with. Everything, we've even got the system kind of hardwired to send everything that, um, everything to your primary care doc. Do I call them every day? I don't, mostly because I don't have time to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but we do try to give them a call um, at the time your hospitalization is complete because they're gonna be the ones that have to, you know, pick up the pick up the baton as it were. It's a little bit of a relay race, I'd say, so. Yep, and they definitely get um, what we call a discharge summary where we mm -hmm. kind of send a, this is when they came in, this is the tests we did, this is what happened each day, this is the new medications that we've changed, this is when I want you to see them back, mm -hmm. and these are things that, you know, may need follow up on. Mm -hmm. That's correct. So, you know, and that is part of the patient's chart, so that will always flow with them mm -hmm. regardless of where they go. So, yes. All right. Well, if you haven't been in the hospital lately, you may not be aware of the important role of a case manager. Prairie Doc reporter Esther Mitchell interviewed Kim Gray of the Brookings Health System about the duties of this position. 
As a case manager, I work alongside two other case managers for Brookings Health System. Our goal is from the moment a patient comes into the hospital, we are their resource, their way of being able to um, get them the needs that they have or that they need before they are needing to go home, essentially. So um, as case managers, we um, establish a relationship with the patient in order to get them medical equipment. Maybe they need home health care when they leave. Uh, perhaps they're not safe to be home any longer and they need a higher level of care. As case managers, we step in and we establish a relationship with the patient and we figure out what works best for the patient by working with them as well and their family members. Case managers assess patient needs, evaluate and create treatment plans, and coordinate care, all while working closely with the patient and the healthcare team. What we have to remember, and sometimes we have to step back and remind ourselves, a patient coming into the hospital, it's a difficult task. Um, it's very cumbersome, it's very overwhelming. They are very scared. Mm -hmm. And if a patient perhaps came into the hospital because they fell at home and now they're looking at a four to six week rehab recovery, they're not always prepared for what is in store. And it's not them necessarily getting back home right away. So. It's very important that on day one or day two, we establish a relationship with them to kind of get that process started, to get that in their heads that, okay, this is a stepping stone. Um, we're gonna get you through this, but we need to do this first before you can actually get home. Some are receptive, others are not, but at the end of the day, it's what's best for the patient. And sometimes they don't always like that, but they understand it at the same time. So it's, it's communication and collaboration. And without those two things, it doesn't work as well. So we do the best job that we can to collaborate and communicate with them. And it's also a collaboration with the entire team that the patient works with here in the hospital. Not only do case managers provide treatment options and cost-effective solutions, they work with the patient's health insurance company and help with discharge planning if the patient has continuing medical needs after they leave the hospital. The best and most rewarding thing is those success stories, really. Being able to have a patient come in and to know that we can make a difference and that we can help them transition and sometimes it's difficult transitions, but we can help them idle them along to um, a better outcome, essentially. Um, it's in gaining their trust. When you first meet somebody, there's a lot of uncertainty. And so as you work through a process with them and they learn to trust you and their family members, and then you are able to provide an outcome for them that they are actually happy with, that's, that's very rewarding. I absolutely love Kim. I think she does such a fabulous job. And collaboration and communication, that is kind of the cornerstone of everything we do. It doesn't matter if you run all the right tests, if you can't explain to the patient why we're running the tests, what we're going to do with that information, and how we're trying to take care of them, it just doesn't work at all. Yeah, it, it can be a little bit difficult if you're not um, conveying the right information. One of the tricks I learned, and I don't know about the both of you, but whenever I first see or first come on service with a patient, I always try to spend more time that day, especially with the family. Um, and I find that because I, I do try to create an open door so people know this is who I am, and then the rest of the time you can call me anytime, just let the nurse know. Um, I find that it actually goes much better versus you know, maybe if I feel like I don't have enough time with the family that first day. Um, so that really helps a lot with the coordination. And then I think just really learning how to use your team to the best of their abilities. Um, thank goodness for our case managers. <laughs> they, they have a really difficult job. And so um, I've learned a lot just as being a part of a team. I think that's one of the most fun parts about this job. Yes, definitely, about everyone working collaboratively together. So a uh, caller from Rapid City is wondering why the hospitalists seem to rotate every day, as her mother never seemed to have the same hospitalist during her stay. Do you want to take you want that to take one? That? Sure, I can field that question. I think it's difficult because Rapid City, for example, is also huge, like Avera McKinnon, um, and they probably have 10 hospitalists rounding during the day. And so I think it makes it difficult to have 
the same hospitalist every day consistently. So I've got to say that's the norm that you don't necessarily get the same physician every single day. And again, I think it's a volume. It's a mm -hmm. volume issue where I'm at in Gillette. We do at least a block of seven, so the person will have the same, you know, physician for those seven days. But after that, it would still transition to a different hospitalist because, of course, we can't have the same person working, you know, 30 days in a row. So there does have to be some transition there. But I would say the bigger the program, the more likely you are to have a different hospitalist. I think the other thing too, in a big group, especially with COVID, we have had a lot of sicknesses within, you know, we have had physicians getting sick. Uh -huh, so there's yeah. been a lot of scrambling behind the scenes um, that, that's, ha that's happened, um, particularly um, with all the Delta variant. Um, we've all managed it really well, um, but hospital scheduling at a big group is highly complex. Um, it is a, an unfortunate byproduct of the need for the individual. So, um, we do the best that we can. We're not always perfect with it. Um, but you know, if you're in the hospital, it's super okay to say, I really want to have the same person for a few days. And, mm -hmm. and most of the time the group is more than willing to accommodate that. Most of us, yeah. you know, our patients are divided up by our triage nurses who are really <laughs> what we call the boss of us. <laughs> um, so we, we really, um, we really are open to that kind of thing. It's just about communicating it and knowing it. So, yeah. Yep, and, and I always tell my patients, you know, here I am in Brookings, I said, it's, it's pretty much me rounding and I'll have a, a PA or an NP helping me. I say, the later in the day you see me, the healthier you are. <laughs> I see the sickest person first. You know, so if you're seeing me right at 8 a.m., you're probably not doing as well as if you see me at, you know, I see you at 1. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we try to triage and see the people that need to be seen, you know, first and, yeah, and, Brookings, you know, here I'm doing you know, Monday through Friday, and then we've got a different person coming on for the weekend, and then another person. And it, you're right, schedules, COVID, because mm -hmm. you remember, we're rounding on the p patients with COVID mm -hmm. in the hospital. So we are literally exposed to it again and again and again yes. for the past, you know, two, two years, years almost. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know I um, was you know, f going on a, a trip and they had the question, have you been exposed to someone with COVID in the last two weeks? I'm like, when haven't I been? <laughs> yes, I have been exposed to someone with COVID every, you know, at least once in the past two weeks for the last two years. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's just the reality of our of our job mm -hmm. and our world. So, so yes, I, I know that, yeah, doctors get sick too, as many exposures. And mm -hmm. every time you put on and take off your protective equipment, there's a potential exposure. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of that COVID that doctors are getting is kind of contamination from mm -hmm. getting the stuff on and off. Cause that's, it's not always easy to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, it was funny, you know, a lot of us got our second vaccines and a lot of us got kind of knocked on our tails. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the theory within the medical community was, you know, I probably had a subclinical um, illness and I just never tested positive because uh, there were a lot of people that it was a pretty tough few days <laughs> after that uh -huh. second shot. Yeah, so, oh, a comment from a viewer on Facebook who is a male nurse at a hospital in South Dakota. I think some of our older patients may have some viewpoints based on who they saw in the hospital years ago. I am often called doctor by my patients who are just not accustomed to having male nurses. Although I think we're making steady progress with more male nurses and more female physicians. It's a, it's a true it's, comment, yep. you know. It, mm -hmm. I think um, a very wise professor at USD once said, ideas we don't know we have have us. Um, Dr. Roach down at USD all those years ago. Um, and so I think what you learn as a female physician in particular is you have to be patient, you have to be earnest, um, you have to be willing to step up and correct. But um, yeah, we are making progress. We have a little ways to go. And I think patience is going to be a virtue in this case. Mm -hmm. Yep, but there have been studies that say female physicians give better care and have better outcomes uh, because I think we're more that those soft skills with empathy, listening, taking more time, you know, those have all been shown to be helpful with patients and healing. So, all right, uh, question here, are you aware of the Legislative No Surprises Act and how does this affect hospitalists? Um, I am uh, aware of it. Um, so the No Surprises Billing Act is about um, understanding what your cost of a procedure or hospital stay or any sort of an, um, an event would be 
um, and it really is for those people who do not have insurance at all. Um, one of the things that we don't really um, talk a lot about in healthcare is that a lot of the insurance companies actually negotiate prices down, so the patients who have no insurance actually have a higher financial risk. So the goal of that bill is for people to get an estimate of what the cost would be prior to scheduling a procedure. Um, I do think it um, really has to do with scheduled procedures, like a colonoscopy, like a scheduled surgery. Um, hospitalizations are a little bit different because they are considered a major health event, and then that might fall into the category of being able to actually apply for um, uh, health insurance off the exchange. So okay. I am aware of it. It does move into that direction of transparency. I think it's a really good thing for patients. It's also very challenging to to, um, to fulfill because it's complicated. Yes. So, well, I know with um, COVID, you know, hospital numbers have been up. It's been harder to transfer patients out of you know, little hospitals to big hospitals. Big hospitals have been sending some of the more stable patients back to little hospitals, you know, because I'll see, oh, transferred back to Flander, transferred back to St. Michael's and, and Tyndall. Um, how have you guys been managing with that, that patient flow to make sure patients are at the right level of care? Um, that's been a big coordination effort um, across our organization. We had the, the luxury or the great fortune of having a completely integrated telemedicine network when COVID hit. Um, and so we had um, ICU services, pharmacy service, emergency services, hospital services, sort of as an umbrella over our entire system when COVID struck. Um, so we did a few things. One is we use data and analytics out of our electronic health record to understand how do we um, how do we even just manage our resources? So how much protect, protective equipment do we have? Um, how, much, how many albuterol inhalers do we have? Those sorts of things. So that was one thing. Um, the second thing with respect to um, sort of managing things in rural health is a lot of communication. Um, Avera McKinnon has a transfer center that's very, very busy. It's incredibly well run. And again, technology helped us. Um, so beyond that, it's uh, really persistence, a lot of communication, and then using technology to help with that. Um, the difficulty is many of our facilities actually had to bring up their level of the, the kinds of patients they would take care of. So we saw a lot of great skill development during this time, a lot of patience, a lot of grace, and a lot of collaboration across the organization. Definitely. And Natalie, are you seeing that at other places as well where it's harder to get people transferred to higher levels of care and you're having to take care of sicker people than you normally would at a smaller facility like in Gillette? Or? Yes, absolutely. I think we're all um, kind of mini intensivists now. Um, you know, we used to try to ship event within 24 to 48 hours and now we're keeping people sometimes the full length of their stay um, and collaborating as Dr. McVeigh uh, talked about with um, specialists at bigger facilities. Um, we actually use UC Health, and so we'll call their pulmonologist or their infectious disease specialist um, and try to get their help um, via telephone. And yes, we're definitely managing sicker and sicker patients. Definitely. And you know, sometimes patients actually like that. I'm like, oh, I can transfer you to Sioux Falls. No, we like it here. There, it's easier for us to stay you know, in touch with our family. And you know, as long as I feel like I can safely do that, yes. Mm -hmm. I, I always want the patient in the best hands possible. And if I know those hands aren't mine, then I want to get them where they need to be, where they can get uh, the care they need. You know, some, some things we just don't have the ability to do, like dialysis in Brookings in, as an inpatient. We do outpatient dialysis, but not inpatient dialysis. So, you know, that you really need a, a kidney specialist, a kidney doctor mm -hmm. overseeing and managing, and that is not me. But definitely, you know, I think our collaboration with specialists over the phone, I, I know the docs down at McKinnon have been fabulous, always willing to take a phone call, always willing mm -hmm. to answer. And then, um, yeah, using those telemedicine, uh, services. Uh, I know you've been really involved with the e-hospitalist program. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk a little bit about that and how that works in these more rural communities? Yeah, sure. So I, um, one of the things that I was able to do during the pandemic, just by the nature of the work I do, is I began to do much more telemedicine um, through, um, it's now Avell eCare. Um, so we were able to um, serve as crisis sites during that time. And basically it's kind of a phone a friend or a FaceTime hospital medicine consult. 
Um, we actually see patients all across the United States um, very busy at night. Um, so 90% of the time when an e-hospitalist service is available, the doctors stay at home in bed. Um, so we're doing those admissions, we're taking care of those sort of cross cover things, and it's really meant to sort of help those local physicians stay in that local community and not sort of burn out with all the call. Um, the other thing during COVID that it's done is it's given a lot of our advanced practice providers who might be independently practicing in a local community, mm -hmm. it's given them uh, sort of somebody to watch their back, help, um, help them grow. And it, it's been really amazing to watch the skill set of people come up uh, over time. So uh, what's really nice for me now is I'm actually able to see patients from my home. I have a whole setup in my home. Um, it, it's, it's a different kind of work uh, because you're not putting your hands on the patient and that's very odd. Um, but you actually end up talking more to the patient <laughs> than you did before. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think the other thing too is back to that technology, right? Um, we actually have devices that we can use to listen to the heart and the lungs. And I, I do say that the, the device for the heart and lung actually I can hear better than a regular stethoscope. So Because nice, you can amplify and kind of adjust the volume. And yeah, yeah, the heart yeah. exam, you can hear a lot of good things. Wow. So yeah, it's, it's great. A um, lot of very small community hospitals, um, we help with them. And then the other thing too is we provide support and then some rationale so that if a patient does need to get transferred to, to a bigger facility, it's very helpful to those um, people locally to be able to say, you know, I talked to my hospitalist and they said dot, dot, dot. Mm -hmm. So it, it is nice to have that extra layer of, I talked to someone else. This isn't just me coming and put mm -hmm. this idea all on my own. I talked to someone else who is mm -hmm. a specialist, who does this every day, who is very comfortable with your, a patient with your situation and, and mm -hmm. go from there. We, uh, yeah, and I think too that, that we have to get sometimes pretty creative with local facilities because the resources are different, mm -hmm. but that's also a challenge and it's, yeah. and it's fun. Definitely. Well, a part of healthcare that has grown a lot during the past decade, and especially during the pandemic, is e-care, also known as telemedicine. Prairie Doc reporter Carter Schmidt explains the role of Avell e-care in Sioux Falls. Avell e-care, which used to be Avera e-care, serves 32 states across the nation. We serve patients in many different areas, from senior care centers, long-term care centers, um, in hospitals, a lot of rural hospitals around our country, um, as well as larger hospitals when we look at our ICU segments, and then also students in schools. So we have school nurses that actually use telemedicine to take care of children. E-Emergency is one of Avell eCare's largest service lines. We help particularly rural hospitals that care for complex emergency patients and then ICU, so we're taking care of critically ill patients in hospitals, as well as hospitalist, which is that inpatient, so not in the ICU, but more on the floor. So we can help in all of those areas. Roan says doctors can monitor patients from almost anywhere. We can see every single beat on a monitor from a patient who is thousands of miles away. And we have cameras right into those rooms and so they can talk to us and we can talk to them. But we use software and computers to take every single data point and bring those forward. Since larger hospitals have seen more patients the past couple of years because of the pandemic, eCare has become a strong resource for smaller hospitals seeing critical patients until they can be transferred to a larger hospital. We're supporting those hospitals that wouldn't necessarily have, say, a critical care doc or maybe even an ICU, and we're helping them to care for those patients up until a bed becomes available. They have also developed an on-demand program for critical care, so help can be there for hospitals across the country, where and when it's needed. It's been something that has grown and it again is something that supports the physician, nurse practitioner, PA and nurses that are there at the bedside, um, but just gives them that extra support by a, a hospitalist physician. Well, I've always enjoyed uh, the eCare um, services. I've actually toured the eCare hub, and that place is just amazing. It's beyond anything I could have ever imagined, you know, in medical school or you know, growing up thinking about being a doctor. Uh, but definitely great services that I've used. Mm -hmm. And in um, Brookings here, we have EICU, which has been really helpful, especially managing mm -hmm. those patients before 
they could be transferred, especially if they're on a ventilator or mm -hmm. at a really high level of acuity. And um, just knowing that there's an ICU doctor immediately available to answer my questions, the family's questions, and to watch in on the the patient, you kind of using those analytics again that we were talking about, mm -hmm. that they can find a problem before we notice it by watching the trends in you know vital signs and blood pressure and heart rate and and all those little details that you might not pick up until it's too late. Yeah, it really is tremendous. I remember um, I was around when I'm dating myself now, but I was around when EICU first went in at McKinnon, and I think our mortality went down by 75 percent within the first like three to four months that we yep. had it. Um, because that was such a proactive thing. And that was at a big, a big huge hospital. I don't know, we don't know what we'd do without it. Yeah. So, Nellie, do you use many e-services or telemedicine at your sites? Um, I do it a couple. Like you said, Brookings, I had used it several times there. Peer also uses an EICU. Um, and when I was there a couple weeks ago, I did use their services because we had a patient not doing well. Um, I think, yes, I think I found it very helpful um, and very useful. Like you said, it's nice to have an intensivist 24 seven that you can just you know, get on with. They can look at the patient and kind of help guide you through um, the next steps you know, to get the patient better and ultimately to a different facility. Yeah, and if you're the only doctor there, it is so nice to have just another doctor to say, hey, this is what I was thinking, this is what mm -hmm. I'm seeing, this is what I'm doing, does that sound reasonable? And for them to say, yep, that's exactly what we would do if you were here. And sometimes that's reassuring to tell a family to say, you know mm -hmm. what, if they were in Sioux Falls, they would be doing this exact same medicine at this exact same rate. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we're not um, denying them anything by having them still well, here. Well, and I think there's another role, and it's the manage up role, right? There are a lot of times where I try to manage the team up because we have a relationship with them. We know that they're there, you know, we know that they do good work. Um, so it is important for the patient to hear, you know what, you're in really good hands. Mm -hmm. It is. So uh, a viewer is wondering what suggestions you have for families who have a family member in the hospital. How can family members be helpful? I think this is a great question. So Natalie, what would you recommend or suggest? Um, I think sometimes it can be tough, at least for hospitalists, when there are multiple family members that we're trying to talk through, you know, talk to throughout the day. So I think it would be nice if there was one family member we could kind of keep abreast of the situation and then they could kind of fill in other family members. I think that's always really helpful because, like you said, when you're busy rounding on 15, 20 patients, it's hard to go back, you know, to a room and talk with the third family member or, or there's another, you know, family member on the phone. So I think it's really helpful when we can have one family member designated as kind of the person who's going to disseminate the information to the rest of the family. Mm -hmm. Or everyone there at the same time. I mean, I've had it where they're like, can I put this family member on speakerphone? Will you talk to this family member? Absolutely. No problem. Yes. I think the other helpful thing is to keep a notebook with questions and answers yes. and take notes. Um, I, I think a lot of families, you know, when you walk out the room, they have a lot more questions that they think about. So I, I like to tell people to keep a notebook. And then I, this is maybe going to sound a little bit different, but occasionally, you know, having a sick family member is incredibly stressful. And sure. sometimes the family dynamics start superseding the care of the individual. So one thing I think a family could really do is just pay attention to those dynamics and don't allow those to sort of get in the way of the care of the patient, because that can be incredibly stressful. And, and many of us, you know, we, we want to take care of everybody, um, but that can be, that can make it very, very challenging. Yeah, I, I think one of the more challenging situations is when there's a family member who's been taking care of mom and dad, seeing them every day, mm -hmm. seeing how they've been, and then someone who comes in maybe for Christmas or Easter and isn't there and haven't seen how sick their mom or dad, mom or dad have been, mm -hmm. and and they just don't understand because that's not in their mind how they should be, and mm -hmm. it, it's scary for them. And then I would say the other thing, particularly for older patients, is have a discussion about what are your goals, right? Like if you, especially somebody with a chronic illness, is your goal to live longer? Is it to go drink fruity beverages on a beach in the Caribbean? <laughs> um, those are incredibly important conversations to have because there might be a moment when mom or dad or family member can't tell you what they think. And what I like to tell the, um, people is in those moments, your job is to do what that person would tell you to do. Were they able to do so right now? 
I find though that if you've had those conversations before it ever gets there, it's number one, very healing, uh, but number two, it allows the family to process very, very differently when a crisis hits. Yes, and you don't want to be having those conversations at two in the morning. No, no, because it's sad. And, it's and I think the other thing too is if a family member is waiting to come, mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of things, there's a lot of complexity to it, but um, I, I think it's a really important conversation to have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I would agree with the writing the questions down. You know, even me as a as a physician, when I am the family member in the room, you know, the doctor like any questions, my mind just goes blank, and I'm like, um, <laughs> I should probably have a very good question here, but I don't. And then they walk out, and I'm like, oh, I was Got gonna, <laughs> you know. Write it down, push the call light, ask the nurse. The nurse can get a hold of the doctor anytime. We don't mind. There's a lot of times where I'll go back, I'll start writing a note, hey, they got one or two more questions. Oh, sure, I'll pop back in and, mm -hmm. and answer. It's not a bother at all. That's what we're here for. It's all about the communication. Mm -hmm. So a couple more questions. Do hospitalists work in the ER? Natalie, do you work in the ER? Um, I feel like I work in the ER, but um, <laughs> we're, we're not ER physicians, but when I go down to admit a patient, I do go to the ER and I spend a lot of time down there because um, I like to talk with the ER physician. I like to talk with the ER nurse. Um, and you spend a lot of pay a lot of time, at least I do, talking with the patient in the ER. Um, and I usually do some of my work down there too. I'll look through their chart, I'll look through labs. That's usually the first place that you meet the family members. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really your first interaction with the patient and the family. And I think that's really important. It's also the easiest place to find the otoscope <laughs> to look in the ear and the ophthalmoscope to look in the eye because I can never find them on the nursing floor. So in the ear, they are, um, you know, they're, they're attached to the wall in the ER. Yes. So I'm not having to hunt them down. So, yeah, so we, we spend a lot of time in the ER. Where do you guys do your admitting from it? You... Um, our admissions are about like trying to I, I, it doesn't sound the right way to say it, but it's trying to get done, right? Because you know the next one's coming. Mm -hmm. So we try to be be down there in a way that's very timely so that when the bed opens up, the patient can go right to the floor. So it's really anywhere from the emergency department. We have an admissions unit. So somebody maybe that coming in from Brookings might go there before mm -hmm. a bed opens up. Um, but we also just do it on the floor as well. Um, do we run traumas and codes and all that fancy stuff? Nope, don't wanna, <laughs> too scary. Um, but we have to have a very good relationship with those physicians uh, because many times the doctors, uh, that's the front line and um, they are really, really good at taking care of patients and making sure they're stable when they come into the hospital. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the next question asks, do the hospitals communicate with the ER team so when they know the severity and condition? Absolutely, they'll call me up and say, hi, I have a 75-year-old FEMA here who came in from home. They fell and were found on the floor after being there at least six hours when their son came to pick up their mail and they didn't answer their, you know, the door. Yeah, so usually, I usually get a pretty good report from mm -hmm. the ER doctor, from the nurse, and... Well, and sometimes, like, we don't tend to do procedures like other physicians do, mm -hmm. so sometimes we need our ED docs to do, like, a lumbar puncture, mm -hmm. or we need them to run another CAT scan, or we need them to do, you know, some additional testing before they come in, just mm -hmm. to make sure that uh, everything's sort of tied up um, when the patient gets to the floor. So we, we are very collegial, we work very well together, we're really the ones who are up in the middle of the night, um, and really the front line for most physicians in the hospital. Yes, and I, I think that since we're there, we're immediately available for the nurses to ask questions if there's a change. And I do think that this is the benefit of having hospitalists because in the old days, the docs rounded on the patients in the morning, they went to clinic, and then the nurses had that dilemma. Do I call the, is this important mm -hmm. enough to call the doctor and interrupt them? And am I gonna get in trouble? Am I gonna get in yeah. trouble? I, am I gonna get in trouble if I don't call? Am I gonna get in trouble if I do call? Yeah. You know, and sometimes, you know, things can go from fine to not fine very quickly. And if your clinic is at Dolly Farms, you're getting to McKinnon, that wouldn't work no. if you need someone immediately. You, you have a hospitalist who is there right now when you need them. I think it's, I think it's a partnership that we share with our nursing colleagues. Um, our nurses teach us many things, but they also take care of us, and I hope we take care of them too. Um, but I think um, that's one of the best. That's one of the lessons you really learn as a physician mm -hmm. is is just the importance of all of that. Because you know I have to go do other stuff, but my nurse is the one that's going to be there to make sure everything happens. 
Yes, yes. And you trust, I mean, the trust and relationship between the floor nurses and the hospitalists, I think it's such a wonderful mm -hmm. partnership. I was actually talking to a, a nurse that I've known for a long time, and we were talking about back in the paper chart days, we used to sit at the nurse's station and I'd have my pile of charts, <laughs> and I'd be like, nobody can touch these. Mm -hmm. um, but the nurses would come by, and we talked a little bit about how, you know, with these electronic health records, that sort of um, bantering on the floors doesn't mm -hmm. happen nearly as much. Um, you know, electronic health records have been really good for medicine in a lot of ways, but there has been some personal touches that have probably gone um, by the wayside, not for the better. So I do miss yeah. that part. Yeah. I don't miss I don't miss writing the notes though. Yes, or or then five different nurses saying, "What does that line say?" I know they, they don't miss having to interpret <laughs> they, they the don't, handwriting. Either. Exactly, doctor. We type better than we write. So, mm -hmm. yes. All right. So a, a viewer sent an email asking, is there any extra training for hospitalists? Is it, it considered a specialty? Um, there is an extra training now. Um, people can do sort of a focused practice. Um, you also can become board certified, but a lot of people haven't gone that direction for a couple of reasons. One is that the certification is, you know, it's like every two to five years or something, so it's not really well developed. But the other thing too is we're internists first, and I think a lot of us feel like, you know, if there came a time where maybe we couldn't do hospital medicine, we'd wanna have that focus, we'd wanna be able to go back to the internal medicine as well. So right now there's not, uh, but many, many of us take a lot of classes in things like quality, leadership, finance, some of those other things, we've become very, very embedded in hospital operations and quality. Um, so although we don't have the additional training from residency, we get on the job and then additional training in spades just by the nature of our work. Yes, definitely. It is uh, definitely an on the job trial by fire. You're going to learn how, how to do this. Mm -hmm. So uh, one last quick question here before we go to break. Um, how does someone in urgent care interact or communicate with clinics and hospitals? Natalie, if an urgent care do they ever contact um, you as a hospitalist? Or? Yeah, we, we get contacted by clinics, urgent cares, definitely. And usually their question is, you know, like you were saying, there's a 75 year old patient, she's here in urgent care, these are her labs. I think she needs to be admitted. Kind of what are your thoughts? And then I think we go through the case with, with the urgent care physician or mid-level and try to determine, you know, what the next step would be. Sometimes the next step is not admission. You know, they're pretty stable. There's nothing new. It can be done as an outpatient. And then if they do need to be admitted, you know, you can really take two roads for that. You can either have them come through the ER if you think, okay, the workup is incomplete. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna need a CAT scan. I'm gonna need other information. Or if, you know, you think it's pretty straightforward, a slam dunk, then I would just accept them to the floor and they would be what's called a direct admission. And then you would have them admitted directly to the hospital and then you would see them when they arrived on the floor and kind of determine where to go from there in terms of their care. But I would say, yes, we get contacted a lot by urgent care and clinics about, um, seeing patients and, and seeing if they need to be in the hospital. All right, excellent. Well, the winner of our drawing tonight is Nancy from Rapid City. Thank you, Nancy, for asking a question during the first 20 minutes of the show. A gift will be sent to you. We'll be back after this. When you watch a medical drama on television, the main characters are generally doctors, nurses, and patients. We rarely learn about the many extras in the background. In an actual hospital, patients are cared for by their doctors and nurses, along with a large supporting cast and crew. Many of these people on stage and behind the scenes rarely get their name and lights. I would like to introduce them now. Before a patient arrives at the hospital, we often rely on emergency medical technicians, or EMTs, and transport teams to safely bring them to the hospital via ground ambulance, helicopter, and airplane. 
Once the patient reaches their hospital room, they are providing direct patient care, including nurses' assistants and patient care techs. They literally do much of the heavy lifting in the hospital. There is an entire team of therapists, including physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech therapists, and respiratory therapists, who play a role in developing a rehabilitation plan for each patient. Wound nurses help manage complex wounds and ostomies. Various radiology techs, phlebotomists, and lab staff help administer the tests needed to diagnose patients. Some play the role of teacher at the hospital. Dietitians, pharmacists, and diabetic educators help patients learn about their conditions, medications, and behaviors that can help them live healthier lives. Social workers and case management teams arrange aftercare plans, including social supports, which take effect when the patient is discharged. Many hospitals have palliative care teams and hospice teams whose primary goal is reducing pain and suffering. Pastoral care teams help with the emotional and spiritual support for patients and their families. We perform our jobs in a clean, healthy environment thanks to the dietary and kitchen staff, maintenance crew, and housekeeping team. Without them, we would be hungry, thirsty, and cold, without clean sheets, gowns, and towels. Information technology departments maintain patient portals and electronic medical record systems, giving patients and their care teams access to essential information. Billing, coding, and insurance filers ensure the patient data entered is accurate and timely. And there are many others I don't have time to mention here. As a hospitalist, I'm a big fan. I get to work with these professionals every day and catch them in a star of the show, in my opinion. Television and movies may give doctors and nurses all the attention, but I hope I've successfully turned the spotlight on the entire cast and crew doing their part for a successful patient story. I hope you join the fan club. Thank you to our guests, Natalie and Jennifer, for volunteering their time to help us learn more about hospitalists and their role in your health care. If you would like to see this episode or hear more episodes of this program, please like and follow us on Facebook and YouTube or visit us at prairiedoc.org. Look for Prairie Doc Perspectives in your local newspaper and be sure to look for this podcast of this program, Prairie Doc On Call, wherever you get your podcasts. From all of us here at On Call with the Prairie Doc, now in our 20th season of sharing truthful, tested, and timely medical information. Until next time, stay healthy out there, people. This is one of the most common reasons people go to the doctor or miss work, and it is a leading cause of disability worldwide. Back pain, next time on Call with the Prairie Doc, celebrating our 20th season. Prairie Doc programs have provided truthful, tested, and timely medical information for 20 seasons. Hello, I'm Dr. Jennifer May of Rapid City and I serve as a board member for the Healing Words Foundation. Please join us as we celebrate this milestone, offering healthcare information in our state and across the region. Rick and Joni Holm began this mission years ago, and every week since then, our Prairie Docs and other medical professionals volunteer many hours to share science-based truth about healthcare on public television, on the radio, in our newspapers, and online. And best of all, everyone has free and easy access to the entire Prairie Doc Library. I ask you to consider making a donation. Please help us continue this important work. Go to prairiedoc.org and make a donation today. Thank you.
Major funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc has been provided by Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call with the Prairie Doc on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call with the Prairie Doc as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions. Brookings Health System. Ophthalmology Limited. South Dakota Academy of Family Physicians. Avera Heart Hospital. First Bank and Trust. Dakota Allergy and Asthma. Vance Thompson Vision. Monument Health. Black Hills Medical Society. Brookings Madison Flander District Medical Society. Pierre District Medical Society. Yankton District Medical Society. Orthopedic Institute. Lake Ponset Sailing Academy. Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy. Dakota Bank. South Dakota American College of Physicians. And Swift Tell Communications. 